Um, hi everybody, my name is Dr. Jenna Condy. I'm a senior lecturer in digital society at Western Sydney University. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm recording um, this video on the lands of the Darug and Gundungurra people. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students um, who are participating in this learning experience with us as well. Um, and yes, that sovereignty is never ceded and that has implications for how we are living, learning and working uh, digitally and materially. Um, and it's important to um, bring, consider those implications within this curiosity pod on identity. Um, and on that note, it's really, really um, great and wonderful to welcome Professor Bronwyn Carlson, um, who is a professor and head of department of Indigenous Studies at Macquarie University. Hi, Bronwyn. Hi, thanks for having me on this podcast. It's really interesting. I mentioned the paper that um, Ryan and I wrote about memes, mm. and one of the places we looked at um, was um, Blackfellow Revolution, which is another site and handle that you can follow. And they had produced a series of memes that were really um, challenging colonialism or challenging the, um, the sort of well-known um, um, narrative of Australian history. Mm -hmm. So those memes were, um, you know, so they would take images of um, like pictures of the stolen generation and add some really quirky and really thought provoking text to it to get you to think about, you know, if we think about Australian national um, sort of narrative, it's around peaceful settlement, it's around no frontier wars, it's around terranalias, nobody's here, mm -hmm. it's around all of these kind of things which we know are not true. So Blackfellow Revolution took this whole series of images to tell the entire story of Australian history thus far and really point out the contradictory nature of those um, stories, you know, as opposed to the realities. So, you know, how can you say that there is um, a peaceful settlement and no war when you've got actual colonisers' um, paintings and representations of them killing Aboriginal people or images of Aboriginal people in neck chains and being imprisoned. Um, and so this is not a peaceful space at all. It is um, a problematic space. And so, yeah, that, that series of memes actually like highlighted that. Um, so, yeah, looking at um, Indigenous sites um, and looking at Indigenous handles, I think is a really great way for students to begin to engage in a more, uh, in a larger political landscape around Australian history and Futures, I mean, that's one of the important thing about some of this work is it really highlights Indigenous futures. Because if we think about the way in which Indigenous people are always written about or thought about, it is quite historical. So it's always like back in the day, you know, before colonisation, everything is historical as if we don't exist in the present or have aspirations to exist in the future. And so what I love about all of the contemporary activism that you see on social media from some of our young people, it's very futuristic. Mm, and the continuity of Indigenous identities and communities, um, it's not sort of done. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's continuing the stories and challenging that mainstream. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so one of the questions I did have was around what um, allies and uh, non-Indigenous non people can do, um, you know, following the lead of Indigenous people that are using social media um, to shift the needle, the dialogue and, and to instigate change. Um, how can we um, best engage and um, support? Yeah, I guess that um, in recent times what we've seen um, is a rise of non-Indigenous people wanting to work out how they can be allies in these spaces. And I think that was really brought to the fore um, because of the Black Lives Matter movement. Because people were like, what can we do? Um, and there were some issues raised on social media around. So the Black Lives Matter movement comes out we see that there's systemic racism in all these kind of institutions. So people want to educate themselves on race and racism. So everyone ran out and bought non-Indigenous authors mm -hmm. um, who wrote about race and racism. And so it was raised on social media then by Indigenous people saying, well, if you want to be a good ally and educate yourself, why is it that you've run out and only want to listen to non-Indigenous voices? You need to be listening to um, Indigenous voices as well. So that, that was really raised... Um, you know, 
um, really loudly on social media and continues actually. So mm. asking people, what is a good ally and what is a performative ally? So a performative ally is just going through the paces and actually wants praise for what they do. Where being a good ally or being an ally that's productive is a little bit different. So there are lots of things that people can do. Mm. Um, so if you aim to be um, an ally and support indigenous social movements, um, one of the things we did see in the Black Lives Matter movement was a lot of non-Indigenous people on the streets also. And I saw in one case, um, non-Indigenous people moved themselves forward so that they became the buffer between Indigenous people and the police. And so there are actually like physical things you can do, but I understand not everyone is out on the street and, that's, and don't have the capacity to do that. So you can actually follow lots of Indigenous people online and retweet and not retweet with a sort of humble brag about yourself that you're doing something good, but retweet the voices of Indigenous people so that they're heard mm -hmm. um, as opposed to seeking some sort of limelight for yourself. So, you know, you can retweet this stuff, but be educated. I mean, that's one of the really great things. And my colleague, um, Dr. Tristan Kennedy, wrote an article about um, racism and how lazy it is because people just want to, um, you know, oh, I'm not racist, I want to operate in this space, but are really lazy in educating themselves. Like, what is it that you want to, um, you know, be part of? Do you want to actually live in a world where these injustices take place, where humans are less valuable than commodities? Um, you know, or do you want to live in a place where there's some equality and um, where we're not seeing these op oppressions of particular groups? Because, like, if we think about it, white supremacy and the way it um, operates, it doesn't actually benefit all white people either. Mm -hmm. So it's only beneficial to a few. So if the majority want to have a um, live in a world that um, there's more equality and there's more um, share of everything for everyone, then you need to educate yourself more around the way in which Indigenous people might view the world because it is really quite different. Um, yeah, don't demand the limelight. Let others have the platform. Let them be heard. Re retweet Indigenous voices. Follow Indigenous people, but also hear what the issues are. Mm -hmm. um, but educate yourself, and that was um, Dr. Kennedy's paper that he wrote, um, I think it was in The Guardian, he wrote specifically about how lazy we have actually become, that we don't understand our own history in this country. Mm -hmm. We don't understand how racism operates. We still buy into that idea that everything is in the past and we can't see a correlation between past actions and policies and how they still operate today, even though it is like blatantly laid out for us. You know, so those past policies of child removal, we can still see in contemporary times the same thinking applies and then removing children. So, yeah, you have to understand the history to be able to function productively, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I think what you said at the very beginning as well about um, being Indigenous is, you know, a political identity. And so, you know, being white is a political identity and sort of acknowledging that and... Um, it's not the universal position and, you know, and it's an identity position that you need to work through and unpick the um, implications of and how that's, you know, how, 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 how are we doing whiteness in social media platforms? And like you said, like with the um, being on the street, um, you can step in, you can step in in social media spaces as well. Yeah, you totally can. And, you know, I think if you plan to operate as anti-racist, so it's something that you will not tolerate, you won't participate in it, you won't stand by and see it, uh, you won't, you don't want to live in a world where that actually gets to function. And so people go, well, I don't want to get in a fight with everyone all the time. But you can merely say to someone, excuse me, but you have mistaken me for someone who thinks like you and I don't. Mm. And you can remove yourself from being part of it. Standing by and remaining silent also gives the people the power to keep going and they feel like they, they can keep going because they have an audience. Mm -hmm. And if you're part of that audience, you're part of the problem. Yeah. Think about how decolonization works. You know, the worst thing about uh, colonization is it limits our imagination to think about solutions in the future. And that's the purpose of it because there, there is not supposed to be a future for Indigenous people. So col colonization actually limits the way non-Indigenous people can vision a future that is shared with Indigenous people also. So if you really want to um, like live in a world that is better, you need to think about it in terms of um, decolonizing your thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you then become an agent for that kind of change? And you can only really do that when you edu educate yourself. Like I had a student just recently say to me, 
I can't believe that um, you think white people get privilege. You're just racist saying that to me. And this is a, a white person saying this to me, that I'm racist against them because I believe that white privilege exists. And so that tells me that person has no concept about what we're talking about, how white privilege operates. And that's the fact that white people can step in in front of the police and have some confidence that you're not going to get a beat down for it. Um, you know, so it, you're certainly not going to get a beat down because you're white. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so those are the differences. So to understand how white privilege works, and it's not a personal attack on non-Indigenous people. It's if you understand how these systems work, then you can subvert them and you can choose not to operate and benefit from them. Mm -hmm. You know, so those are the important things. So education is hugely important for people. So before you even go forth and, you know, going to be an, an agent of change in social media spaces, work out what the history is in this country and how it operates around the world, because then you will really be able to come from a decolonized position.